Good morning. It's good to see everybody here. Missed you all last week. There's uh, one uh, infomercial that Paul asked me to remind everybody, and that is the 40 days of fasting. So if you'd like to participate, you are seeing who? <laughs> Just go to the board. Okay. Go to the board. Yeah. Good luck to those who are fasting on July 4th. Yeah. It goes, uh, well, good morning. Uh, I'm excited about the word God has this morning. I wrestled all week. My wife will tell you. I was up late again last night. When Paul asked me to share, I had a word that I was sure I was going to share. I had worked on it, poured a lot into it. As a teacher, you like to get into a new text, dive in. And uh, it was a few days later that I just felt the Lord move me in another direction. I wasn't too thrilled, only because it's a text I've used. And I, I don't know, it gets hard to sift through that. You know, do I say that again? Which way do I go? I've done this before. And I wrestled. I got to the wake for uh, Michelle on the Thursday night. I spoke with Nancy, who was to speak last week. What are you speaking on? So she tells me, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically she could have gone down one road, but was going down another, and the road would have been a prelude to what I felt I was going to do today. I still resisted. I got to my dad's church last week to listen to him preach and visit with my parents. And my dad, who this sermon is all about, I'm going to honor my dad this morning, so I can say this next comment. He's up there preaching, and it's just taken him forever to get to the point. Someone asked me once, what's the difference between you and your dad when you preach? So the best example I can give you is, I'd look at that and say, that's a chair. He would tell you five, six reasons why that's a chair. It'd take him a little longer to get to that. So I'm sitting in the, in the pew in, with Michelle, and I'm like, Dad, get to the point. What is taking so long? And he had a great outline. He was talking about heroes. It was Memorial Day weekend, and he was leading to Jesus, the ultimate hero who laid down his life. And I should have been a little more enthusiastic about that outline, but it hit me. The Holy Spirit hit me in that sermon and really rebuked me because in front of me preaching was my hero, was my hero that has poured his life into me and given to me. And at 75, preaching in front of a church, giving everything he had, pouring his heart into it. And I started having flashbacks and moments in my life that God had walked me through with my dad, and I just felt very humbled, very grateful, and very annoyed with myself that, again, I had taken for granted my dad. And I want to speak to you this morning about the Father's heart, God the Father. Nancy touched on love last week, and uh, I did listen to the message last night, and I just had two quick points for that. One, my 25th anniversary was last year, and my wife did not want to downgrade her diamond. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Ron, you and I need to hang out more. <laughs> uh, I'm in the 103rd Psalm. This is a message I put together several years ago in seminary. The instructor gave us an assignment in class. She gave us a portion of scripture. We had three minutes to look at the scripture, come up with at least a three-point sermon, maybe four, no more than four, and then pray. So you can imagine the prayer in that room as we were trying to do this sermon for 50% of our grade. And the Holy Spirit had to work. The words jumped off the page because I was in a period of time where back then I took my dad for granted. He had helped me through a tough time. He's always helped me spiritually, but this was something that he gave to me. He gave his time. He traveled down to Virginia where we were in seminary, and the words just came, and I put this sermon together, and I had a chance to preach it at the campus church, and the Lord brought me back to this. This is the only sermon I've ever preached uh, that I've kept the notes to. It's special, because it's about my dad, so I want to share it with you this morning. The 103rd Psalm, David writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, we'll touch on that a lot today, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your soul with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Remember that phrase, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you, angel, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places in his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Quite a psalm, David wrote. Let's pray. Father, as we deliver this message this morning together, I just pray that you would prepare our hearts and we give your Holy Spirit free reign this morning. We pray that you would convict and encourage where needed. And we pray that we would leave here with a better understanding of you and your heart for us. In Jesus' name, the strong, strong Son of God. Amen. Amen. The first thing you need to understand, and it's summed up in this psalm, God loves you unconditionally. Nancy touched on that. Absorb that for a moment. That the creator of the universe, almighty God, who transcends time and gravity and every law of physics, has one thing on his mind this morning, you. There is nobody that he loves more than you. There is nobody that he wants to succeed more than you. You are at the forefront of his heart and his mind, and he thinks about you all the time. So much he doesn't sleep at night just thinking about you. Just let that grip your heart for a moment. I don't know why God loves me. I try to rationalize it and it doesn't make sense because I'm a problem, but he loves me unconditionally. There is nothing you have to do to earn God's love. Nothing. It doesn't matter where you've gone. It doesn't matter why you went there. Doesn't matter where you're going. Doesn't matter what you did. God loves you and there's nothing that you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. You're stuck with it. If you are breathing this morning, God loves you. Turn to somebody, say, God loves me. Say it with an edge, God loves me. It's unconditional. There is nothing you have to do to obtain it. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, Jesus, that we've talked about in our church slogan, because he loves you. Several years ago, I was in Virginia my wife would come up to Massachusetts to visit her family every summer, three or four summers, and I would stay back in Virginia. I ran youth camps. One summer, my daughter, Rebecca, who's here with us, the oldest, stayed with me and helped me. We ran a community dance that night for a town. We had to run these different nights in the town. One was a bingo night, one was a dance, and we got home late on a Friday. I never would check my messages late at night, but I don't know why I went to the phone, but it was flashing and I checked my messages and my wife was on the other end of the phone. Scott, this is Michelle, her voice was cracked. Scotty has been hit by a car. And then a pause. And I'm just, I'm sure the next words were he he wasn't alive. I replayed that message about 15 times and it was exactly eight seconds that her pause was and it was the longest eight seconds I've lived. But he's okay. He had been riding his bike. He was pedaling out of a driveway. 
He was looking over his shoulder, right into the road, was thrown about 40 feet. He landed, when we would go look at the scene, about this far from the edge of the tar that would have just gouged his head onto a dirt area, and God spared him. There was a blood clot near his brain. They had to open up his skull. In the back of his head, he had 30 some odd staples. I had to take care of some stuff the next day and round up everything. And I made my way up to Massachusetts to see him. He was at, uh, he was in Boston. And when I got in the room, he was all drugged up weak, frail, this little kid, and he was the most precious sight I've ever seen. And at no time did I think about yelling at him about why he didn't wear his helmet and why he was looking over his shoulder and why his room was dirty because my love for him was unconditional. Nothing else mattered. We could deal with other stuff later. All that I needed to see was my son was alive and I embraced him sitting in a hospital bed, just weeping that my son was alive. Unconditional love. I think in scripture, the, the picture, the parable that's painted, that can we most clearly see the heart of a father that I see is in the prodigal son parable. But in Luke, the prodigal son leaves. He wants his inheritance early. We all know the story. Back then in the culture, the oldest son is two thirds of the inheritance would go to him, one third to the youngest son. And he wants it early to go live a life, a hellion, basically. I had a pastor that visited that culture years ago and I, he asked some people in the culture about different Bible things. And one of them was about this parable. And he said, hey, what would happen? What would really happen if the son did that? And the person's answer was, it wouldn't happen. No, nah, no, nah, I know. I know it wouldn't happen. But what would really happen if the son did that? It wouldn't happen. This is the most defiant, rebellious, egregious act in that culture. The people that were listening to Jesus explain this parable. I can just visualize them wanting to get their hands on this kid, even though it's a parable, because it went against everything. This was a defiant act that just said, I'd rather my father be dead. He's dead to me. I want my money and I want to go do what it is that I want to do. And the father gives the money and off he goes. And I'm going to touch on the parable. We fast forward and we see the son coming back. What's the father's reaction? It is just unconditional love. There's my son. He's coming back. There's no talk about what he did why he did it, where he was going, what happened when you were gone. All he cared about is that he could see his son and his son was coming home. And that's the heart of the father. That was the heart when I went in the hospital room. I thought my kid for eight seconds, I thought my kid was dead. I thought he was gone. And just to see his face alive, just drugged out and not even really coherent as this little kid was just the most precious sight I've ever seen unconditional love of the father. God loves you unconditionally. The prodigal son's father loved his son unconditionally. He really loved both of them. And he explains that in the parable. But most of the emphasis is on the, the younger son. And he just loved him. It didn't matter what he did. Verse five says, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. God the Father wants to bless you. I think at times we confuse provision with blessing. We think God owes us a bunch of stuff. The father didn't throw a party when the kid left. He threw a party when the kid made a decision to come back. So there are some times where there is responsibility of ours. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Humble yourself and pray and I'll hear your voice and I'll give you these things. I think we confuse that sometimes, but what we should know is that it is at God's heart to bless us. He's not thrilled when you look in your checkbook and there's nothing there and the mountain of bills are there. Now there could be reason why that's there. I'm not, that's another sermon, but know that God promised to provide and he also wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. Maybe when I say the word father, you cringe. Maybe your experience with your dad was horrible. Maybe it's not a good topic. 
For me, my dad was always loving on me. I have visuals of him praying with my mom every morning. He loved my mother unconditionally. That's the best thing he could have ever done. He blessed me all the time. It was his heart to bless me. And God wants that for us. And so maybe you're here today and you can't even rationalize that phrase, God's my father, because your experience has been so horrific. But God wants to heal that this morning. God wants to heal that because it doesn't change that he is your father. He does love you unconditionally. He wants to bless you. And he loves you. I don't know how to say it. He, he wants to embrace you. So just open up for that because God can heal that. God can heal that this morning. And I didn't have that in my childhood. I mean, it wasn't a perfect childhood. My dad's a Red Sox fan. That's one negative. Uh, it's a good game last night. Uh, but he wasn't perfect. But he always loved me. And he would bless me. There were times my dad would find me at the park and he would just grab me and we'd ride and he'd take me to go get ice cream. He'd take me to a game. There were always things that he was doing for me just to say, Scott, I love you. I love you. And God wants that for us. That's his heart. That's his heart. The psalmist lays it out. God loves me. God wants to bless me. He doesn't want to just give me something. He wants to give me the best things. I'm his child. Think about those times where you just were in a store. I, I'm guilty all the time with my grandkids. I just buy because. Uh, it's the Ron in me, right? <laughs> uh, but I want to bless them. I want to, see the f I want to see their face when I hand it to them. And God's like that with us. God's our father. It's an intimate relationship. This is a very intimate psalm that David lays out, where he just talks about the attributes of God. And he even mentions, uh, as a father pities their, his kid, that intimacy between a father and a son, a father and a daughter. Maybe you, you, you got to forgive today. Maybe that's where we're going. The past has been tough. But God's there. God, your father's there with an open heart, with unconditional love, with a heart to bless you. So great is his mercy toward those who fear him. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Several times, mercy, compassion, mercy, compassion, grace, unmerited favor. The son deserved no, no grace. The father is out looking for the son every day, the scripture says. He's looking for his son because he wants him to come home. He's hoping he comes home. And remember the living back then, it wasn't, you know, I had a house here and then 50 yards, another house. This pretty tight quarters living. This guy was a respected guy. He wore robes, he had servants, r wealthy. He knew that if the townspeople saw that son coming, they'd jump that guy. He wouldn't make it to his father because what this kid did was so egregious. So there was a protection in looking for his son. There was a hope and that's God looking at us. Always look at us, guide us, protect us. Spare us. How many times? I get in my car, I drive, I get delayed, and I get down the road, and I, there was an accident five minutes ago right where I would have been. I mean, we've all had that story. So the father sees the son from afar, and he's coming. What's his reaction? Nancy touched on this last week about football players celebrating in the end zone. And that's God's reaction when he sees us when we just make any step toward him, the reaction is just jubilation and celebration. There's my son right there, there he is. There's Scott right there and he's coming. Come on, you can do it. Keep coming, keep coming. I've got these people in Bridgewater I want you to share to. I've got these people in Carver that you're gonna impact their life. I got all these youth that I'm putting in your area that I want you to do. Come on, I love you. Come on, I love you, you can do it. You can do it. Paul and Karen, Bridgewater, I'm gonna give it to you. Keep coming to me. Becca, Carrie, I love you. Keep coming, keep searching out God, everybody. Work to him, that's the reaction. The angels stand and applaud. Everybody's excited because you're moving to God. You're moving toward your father and nothing else matters. He loves you. 
That's the mercy and the grace he shows because he could have sat and screamed at his kid. He could have let the town jump him, but he ran to him, which was another sign. You don't run in a row back then. You don't do that. That was against the culture. It was against the grain. All the norms were God because all he focused on was the son. I got to get to my son. He's alive. He's well. He's coming. He's mine. I'm going to hug him. Get the fatted calf. Let's celebrate. He didn't deserve that. He deserved a smack in the face. He deserved way worse than that. But they celebrate. That's the God we serve. That's your father. That's your father looking out for you to protect you and love you every minute of every day. Grab hold of that. That is unbelievable and I can't comprehend it. That he loves me. It doesn't make sense to my logic. God is merciful and gracious. He's compassionate toward us. He's graceful for, to us when we don't deserve it. I don't deserve to stand before you and present anything to do with the Bible. I should be sitting in some studio apartment paying child support for the jerk of a husband I was when we got married. God is graceful. God restores, God redeems time. It doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done. Just make your step to God and head back. Just head back. We talked last time about our lens. What lens are we looking through? Turn your lens. Just look to him. Just take a step. He didn't wait for the son to get to him. He started running after him. Just make a step toward God. God loves you. God loves you. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. This is where I want to end with a main point here. God's forgiveness for you is instant and it's whole. You don't go before a jury and you're acquitted on six counts, but two of them you're guilty. The moment you ask for forgiveness, you are forgiven. First John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us. Thank God, because I'd be in a lot of trouble if this weren't a truth. God forgives. I've let my dad down. He wouldn't say that. He'd just talk about how proud he is of me. But I've let him down so many times but he functions with me and acts toward me and loves me as if it just never happened. I was at Christ for the Nations in the early 90s. I graduated high school. I had no clue what I wanted to do. So I went to Bible college. <laughs> Get my dad off me, right? And uh, I spent, Greg would appreciate this, being a, I spent most of my time in the gymnasium. That was my studies. Uh, Greg's son was a, Phenomenal basketball player in high school. So, uh, I'm in a chapel one morning and the preacher is teaching and he's telling a story. And I honestly don't remember if he was telling the story that had happened to him or he was just telling the story. But I remember leaving the chapel to walk to my room and I'm just whining, complaining to the Lord. I'm like, why don't I ever get these pictures? The irony, right? <laughs> uh, why don't I ever see anything? I was so out of touch, that's why. But uh, I get to my room, I take a nap. Again, I was a very intense student, so I'm napping. Uh, and I wake up in this cold sweat. My roommate thought something was wrong. And for a few moments, I think I shared this at Life Group, in a few moments, I, was, I dreamt that dream. I was like in the scene. But I woke up and it was very real to me and I was soaking wet. And this was the dream. I was in a waiting room up in heaven with just multitudes of people. And each person would get called and they would watch a video of their life. And depending on how that video went would determine whether you got in or whether you weren't in. Needless to say, I was a little bit worried. And I would watch heroes of the faith get called in. And I'm like, I, have, I can't match their resume. I mean, Paul wrote most of the Bible, New Testament. I'm out. And then I'd watch some people that I didn't think too highly of. And I'd puff my chest out. And I thought I was good. Finally, my name was called. And I go into the room. And here comes the screen. And a video clip shows. And it shows something of something I did nice to somebody. And then there was another clip. 
and another clip. It was probably the best 15 seconds of my life, right? <laughs> Showing all these good, these good things. It's God's greatest hits. And then it says the end. And trumpets are sounding and people are celebrating and confetti are going on and I'm in. And I'm looking around, I'm like, something's wrong. How do you tell God he just made a mistake? Something's not right here. I know that's not the whole video. There's no way. I know those things I did that were not on that video. And I'm just overtaken with guilt and I can't get myself to go in. And then Jesus appears and I get taken over to him and he sits me down and I'm on his lap and I'm, he's looking at me and it's a feeling. I, I don't even know that I can really describe it, but it was a warmth and a feeling of love that I've never felt anywhere. And he says to me, Scott, I did not forget those things. You see, you know, there's a scripture that says God throws out our sins. It's referenced here. God doesn't forget anything. That's not theologically sound. He doesn't forget anything. He didn't forget where Mars was hanging. Uh, he doesn't forget anything. But this is what he said to me. I choose not to remember. I choose not to remember. I remember, I don't forget any of that stuff, but because of my love for you, I choose, I make a decision not to remember those things. That's what God does for us when he forgives us. He knows what we did way back yonder, yesterday, but he makes a decision out of his great love for you. You're his child. I'm not going to remember that. You're white as a lamb because of the blood of Jesus. No greater love but to send Jesus. That's the Father. His forgiveness is whole. His forgiveness is instant. You don't have to carry anything around. You don't have to feel that guilt. If you're here, and that word Father just, mm, you can't let go of it. Embrace God. If you're the Father, the man, I didn't really live up to that. God can take care of that. Give that over to him. Don't carry that around. As a father, I, I look at, uh, three of my daughters are here today, and I think of the things, and I'm like, man, I wish I had just done these things differently. I wish I had followed my dad's plan, what he gave to me, and I've, I've messed up so many times. And I love my kids so much. I just give that to the Lord. I can't carry that around. Although they think I'm perfect, I'm not. <laughs> I want to play a song, have us listen and worship in the song together, and then we'll wrap up and have some prayer time. But remember, God loves you unconditionally. He wants to bless you. He's merciful and gracious to you, and he forgives you. That's the heart of the Father.